Hey guys, hope everyone's having a good day. It's me, Rocco, again. Thanks for coming back to my channel. And today we're going to be talking about another album. Uh, keeping on with the Uriah Heap discography review and discovery. Because as you guys probably know by now, if you've been following my Uriah Heap videos, I'm just getting into this band now. And by now, I mean this year, 2020. And it's been an awesome ride so far. I'm on the magician's birthday right now. And I'm really taking my time, you know, listening to albums one by one, digesting them, going, listening to other music. That way I, I don't get burnt out. I really want to absorb all this amazing band has to offer. And today we're going to be talking about their famous third album, Look At Yourself, released in 1971. An absolute classic album. An album that really is considered to be the epitome of Uriah Heep in the 70s. An album that solidified all the disparate sounds they had had on their previous two albums and really fused it into a cast iron masterpiece and uh a lot of people love this album i mean uh shout out to pocket full of heap amazing youtube channel uh very passionate about the band uriah heap and i believe this was either this or yeah i think this was his favorite album as well as pete pardo another very influential music reviewer um my favorite youtube channel by the way uh, i believe this is his favorite as well and you know, I could definitely see why. This album here has it all. It's got the heaviness. It's got the lighter side of Uriah Heap. And what I love about it is that they really combine the light and shade in each and every track on this album. Really, there isn't any one-dimensional track. Everything really has a lot of tricks and twists and turns up it. And there's a few epic songs as well with the epic 10-minute July morning and uh, the 8.5 to 9-minute long um, Shadows of Grief, which are both top-tier Uriah Heap songs, literally upper echelon tracks, as well as a lot of other songs peppered throughout that are just as fantastic. So, really guys, I don't have much to say in this review because it's just a fantastic album. You just gotta go out and listen to it. Honestly, it's instantaneously amazing, and you're gonna love it from start to finish. It's just an absolute classic. Uh, but in this review, I'm just gonna focus more on the track-by-track -track discussions because really, all these songs are just so memorable, so melodic and interesting. And I think that Uriah Heep and Ken Hensley in particular their primary songwriter and composer, had really matured up to this point, and uh, we're just cranking out just classic after classic after classic. I mean, these guys, they're kind of like the Beatles of proto-metal or early 70s hard rock, because their melodies are so fantastic, and their harmonies are just infectious. So, uh, so yeah, look at yourself. Definitely a classic album. The album cover is kind of lackluster, to be honest, so it might scare a few people away. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's basically just a mirror with, uh, I guess if you had the original LP, it would have this like kind of glossy sheen to it where you can actually look at yourself in the mirror, hence the album's title. But uh, on Spotify and CD or whatever other modern medium you're listening to it on, it, it kind of it's kind of a shitty, lackluster album cover, but the music contained within is anything but. Now, when I first heard this album, I had come up fresh off Salisbury and I... Uh, if you guys saw my previous review, you'll know that I absolutely love that album. And to this day, I, I really got to say that that's probably my all-time favorite Uriah Heap album. I just love the eccentricity behind it. I love that epic 16-minute orchestral piece there. But really, if I had to pick an album that most represented Uriah Heap's overall sound from what I've heard so far, it's got to be Look at Yourself. This album has a bit of everything. And even the next album, Demons and Wizards, uh, they, you know, they got a little bit poppier, a little bit folk, uh, not folkier, uh, a little bit on the lighter side. There's still a lot of heaviness there, but I really think that this album here combines the best of both worlds. And uh, I'd say, objectively speaking, this is probably the best Uriah Heap album. Although, the progressive rock fan within me and my own personal opinion kind of leads me to prefer Salisbury, but this is definitely a close second, as well as Demons and Wizards, which is just absolutely great. Magician's Birthday, I'm still, I'm still getting into, so hold the phone on that opinion, but it, it's great so far, so Excellent stuff. All right, guys, so let's talk a little bit about the history as always, and then we'll uh, review this bad boy. All right, guys, so the history behind this album, pretty simple. Not many uh, huge lineup changes in the band, although there was one lineup change. Uh, before the making of this album and after the Salisbury tour, drummer Keith Baker, who really only appeared on that Salisbury album, uh, he left the band and was replaced by a guy named Ian Clark, who also would just have a brief stint in the band, only performing on this album here. But I really think he does a fantastic job. And uh, as for Keith Baker's drumming, you know, it, we don't really miss him that much. His drumming was solid and good, but nothing exceptional. And uh, it's kind of like the first three albums of Uriah Heep were shuffling the drummers. But with Demons and Wizards, their fourth album, they would have a solid lineup that would go on to record a couple, a couple releases. So at least there was some stability there. But the funny thing about Keith Baker is we don't really know why he left the band. All the sources I've read 
just said, and including Uriah Heep's website, just said it was time for him to leave or time for him to go. So I don't know if he was fired or he just quit the band. Who the fuck knows? And apparently no one really heard from him since. Even uh, Mick Box says, like, no one really knows what happened to him. It was like a true spinal tap moment where he just vanished into thin air. So I don't know, Keith, I don't even know if he's fucking alive at this point. But anyway, uh, so that was basically the only lineup change. Nothing major. The rest of the band was still there. We got Ken Hensley on organ, keyboards, guitars. Not lead guitar, but, you know, he did some slides, some acoustic. And uh, the main composer of the band at this point was composing most of their tracks. Really the main creative force behind the band. We got Mick Box on guitars. And uh, David Byron, the incredible vocalist with an insane range, obviously, on vocals. And I believe he didn't really play any instruments. As well as Paul Newton still on the bass. This will be the last album with Paul Newton. And uh, and the new addition, Ian Clark on drums. So uh, after Salisbury, they went on their first U.S. tour. And at this point, they hadn't really made waves in England. Both their albums didn't really chart. And uh, they didn't really have any uh, singles behind those albums that, that made it big for them there. But uh, when they went to the States, they were open. They were welcome with open arms. Again, this was 1971 now, or at least late 1970. And the whole hard rock scene was really blossoming in the States. Led Zeppelin had released their their fourth album, and uh, that that was huge. Deep Purple had already had made In Rock, and I think now Fireball was coming out. Uh, Black Sabbath, obviously, with Master of Reality and uh, Paranoid. So hard rock was really growing in the States, and they were really welcome with open arms. I believe the first few shows they played there were just full-blown 20,000 seat arenas opening for Steppenwolf and Three Dog Night and things like that, which kind of a funny combination. I understand Steppenwolf, but I don't know, Three Dog Night, maybe a weird mix. But back then, the opening bands didn't really have to conform or sound like the main act, so so who knows? And it was a good tour. They went on and uh, they were they were uh, really surprised at how, you know, how the U.S. fans appreciated their unique brand of hard rock. So very good tour. Then they went back into the studio recorded this thing, and uh, yeah, they recorded in, in July of 1971, but it was released, I believe, in September of that same year. And yeah, uh, not much is known about the make actual making of the album in terms of the production and what went, went on behind the scenes, but apparently it was a creative peak for the band. Mick Box is a really big fan of the album, and uh, everything was going well for the band, even commercially. This album here was the first of their albums to really chart. I think it went to number 30 or something on the UK charts or somewhere around there. And they had a lot of success in Germany as well. So really look at yourself as a major stepping stone for the band. They were uh, they were really, you know, comfortable at this point, really, uh, really confident in their own abilities. And it really shows on the album here. There's really nothing that that screams indecision or they didn't really know what direction they were going on. It was a band with a mission. And uh, this is their mission statement. Look at yourself as, again, just a solidification of everything that made the band great. And uh, it's great that it made waves and, you know, really paved the way for their wider success with the next album, Demons and Wizards, and The Magician's Birthday. And I, I really think if they kept it up after that, uh, they could have easily have been up there with Zeppelin and Purple and Black Sabbath. But sadly, uh, and again, this is, this is just coming from what I've heard about the band based on their history. Uh, the next few albums after... Uh, I believe it was after that, kind of went downhill and the band weren't really gelling and it kind of stifled their growth at, at that point. I think with the album Wonderwall and Onward and then uh, David Byron's alcohol problem got in the way and things really fell apart. Now, thank God Uriah Heat persisted and they kept going forward and to this day, they're still performing and I cannot wait to buy the first concert ticket these guys play here in, in Toronto, Canada, because uh, this coronavirus thing is really fucking up my plans to see all these amazing bands. And as soon as it's over and Uriah Heep goes on tour, you bet your bottom dollar I'm going to be in that fucking arena or that theater or wherever the fuck they play these days. Because I really want to see these guys. And uh, again, it's just incredible how they continued all these years with 24 studio albums under their belt. So by the time I review them all, if I review them all, because I don't review every album, only the ones that interest me, we might be looking at like 2023, 20, 2024 here, guys. Cause, but be patient, be patient. I'll review. So anyway, guys, that's basically the review. Uh, sorry, the history behind the album. Nothing really fancy here. Just a band that's really confident and uh, doing what they do best. All right, guys. So as I mentioned before, what I absolutely love about this album is how Uriah Heep really combined all the elements of their sound, the core elements in each and every single one of these tracks. 
Uh, whereas on previous albums, especially their debut, but a little bit on Salisbury as well, you really had, uh, you know, each and every song kind of taking on its own kind of distinctive feel and distinctive atmosphere. Uh, again, side one of Salisbury was a bit different. It did have a lot of, uh, a lot of that synthesis. So that was kind of like a transitional album. And, but side two, again, with that long orchestral epic, Uriah Heep would never do anything else like that ever again. And it sounded nothing like any of the music on side one. So again, a lot of variety on that album. But on this album here, every each and every single song just perfectly fuses those classic Uriah Heep um, tendencies. And the light and shade is absolutely fantastic, especially on the longer tracks like July Morning and Shadows of Grief, but even some of the shorter ones as well, like Tears in, their, Tears in Your Eyes and things like that. Really, it just feels like an awesome synthesis. So you got that amazing slide guard guitar playing. You got those heavy, crunchy, distorted riffs combined with that Ken Hensley organ sound. You got David Byron's falsetto vocal soaring into the stratosphere. You got the band harmonizing. You got the catchy melodies. All the amazing things that make your eye heap unique on each and every one of these tracks. And you never, with the exception of um, of the ballad of the album, the name is escaping me at the moment, I think uh, What Should Be Done, uh, each and every one of these songs, you can't really classify it as you know a, a slower track or a more up-tempo song or a heavy song or a lighter song. Really, you got all the elements just perfectly interwoven, and uh, that just really shows that the band had a lot of confidence. But they also keep the progressive song structures from Salisbury, which I really love. There are a lot of unexpected tempo changes and you know false endings and things like that that really keep the song unique. And again, especially on the track July Morning, the, the track is so triumphant and optimistic, but then at the end it gets pretty dark and sinister. And I love that as well. And I also love the heaviness of the album. There are just moments where it, just absolute headbangers, like the title track, um, Tears in Your Eyes as well, the final song, Love Machine. Just some rip-roaring riffs that are just really heavy, really crunchy. Remind you of stuff like uh, like Gypsy on the first album. And uh, a few tracks on the second album as well. So the heaviness is still there. And I, I find that going forward on the Demons and Wizards album, which is incredible. It just lost a little bit of that heaviness. But this album here definitely has it. And I also noticed that it has a little bit less of the folk-inspired stuff uh, that appeared on the previous album. Like songs like The Park and... Uh, Lady in Black, which were fantastic songs. This album here kind of scraps the acoustic stuff uh, in favor of more electric, more electrifying and uh, heavier material, which is great. But with the harmonization and the melodies and everything, it never feels like a heavy metal album. It does at points, but it always has that touch of poppiness, that touch of lightness that, again, makes me consider these guys the Beatles of early proto-metal. And uh, again, there were no shows of virtuosity or anything like what Deep Purple was doing. But uh, the instrumentation is just absolutely fantastic. Everyone's at the top of their game. Ken Hensley's organ sound is perfect. Mick Box throws in all kinds of solos. Uh, and amazing riffs as well. I find that his riffs on this album are really memorable and uh, intense as well. So definitely getting a little bit better at writing the riffs. And the whole band is just gelling perfectly. David Byron, what can you say about the guy one of the greatest singers of all time. And I find that, you know, on this album here, he really shines when he's singing solo, like tracks like July Morning and uh, Tears, uh, not really Tears in Her Eyes, kind of forgetting the other track where, you know, where it's just him without the harmonization. And I wish there was like a little bit more of that because his vocals are that strong, but you can't complain with those beautiful Uriah Heep harmonies there. Just absolutely fantastic. And again, I like how the album's structured. I like how Side One is a good mix you got an epic, you got a barnstorming rocker, uh, side two, you got like the you got the ballad of the album, the darker, brooding track, and uh, a great rocker closing things off. So it's you get that variety switched throughout. But again, I just want to emphasize that you can't really classify each song as a ballad, a hard rocker, or whatever. So that what I just described is kind of an exercise in futility. But uh but yeah, just overall such a great album, so accessible. I mean, you put this bad boy on and you're just rocking out for 40 minutes straight, and it's just a perfect balance of everything you expected from the previous two albums. Just just fantastic stuff, guys, and very influential. I mean, you hear a lot of Queen on this album, especially with their with the harmonies and the falsetto and everything like that, so very influential on the band Queen. Uh, but yeah, such a, great, such a great album, guys, and I really don't really have much more to say about it. I mean, it's just a classic from start to finish. Um, you know, I wouldn't quite put it up there with band, like, albums like In Rock and Black Sabbath's first few albums, or even Zeppelin's first few albums, but it's definitely, like, riding on its coattails, like, it's almost as great as those albums. But, uh, 
incredible. So I wholeheartedly recommend it, guys. Now let's dive into the track-by-track -track reviews while I'll really talk about this album in depth. Holy fuck, guys. What an album opener. The title track, Look at Yourself, is five minutes of sheer proto-metal intensity. I mean, this has got to be one of the more intense, heavy Uriah Heap tracks. And uh, it really kills me every single time. I love how everything just fits into place. The organ, the guitar, the percussion. This is Ian, Ian fucking, I'm forgetting his name already. God damn it. I hate when I do that. Ian Clark. This is his statement on the album. His drumming performance here absolutely drives the track. But Ken Hensley definitely steals the show with this absolutely screaming, intense organ that runs through the entire track. Heavily distorted and just insane. I freaking love the, the organ on this track. One of my all-time favorite Uriah Heep songs. And uh, it's actually sung by Ken Hensley as well. He sings the lead vocals, which is pretty... Pretty rare for this album. I think this is the only track where he sings lead vocals. On the previous one, he did sing lead on a couple tracks. I think uh, Lady in Black and uh, High Priestess. But on this one, he just sings lead vocals on this one. Which is kind of weird because, again, with a singer like David Byron, why not use him to his fullest capacity? But uh, Ken Hensley does a fantastic job as well. And I just love how sharp his organ sounds on this song. It just cuts in right away, and there's a furious drum beat going on in the background. It's it's absolutely heavy and barnstorming shit. And it has this amazing drive to it, especially when Ken Hensley comes in with these rapid-fire organ riffs with the... It's just absolutely incredible. And the backing vocals, the harmonies, with the... Oh, and look at yourself! It, it, it's just absolutely furious. Uh, one of the more up-tempo Uriah Heep songs. Uh, and then the song at the two-minute mark gets into this amazing instrumental section. Really starts building up with the organ, but then the guitar joins in. And Nick's box just delivers an extremely intense uh, guitar solo. Really intricate solo as well compared to what he was doing before. And uh, it's not a wah-wah solo. It's just a straight-up heavy metal, climactic, and intense guitar solo that you wouldn't really expect from Mick Box. Uh, usually he plays more tasty uh, not funky, I was going to say funky solos, but you know what I mean. This one here, Richie Blackmore could have fucking played the solo. It's it's amazing. Then the organ comes in, it's just, again, extremely distorted. And this part here is just absolutely intense. And then at the 3 minute 25 second mark, we get my absolute favorite part of the entire track. Where we get this amazing percussion section. Uh, absolutely awesome. Sounds like you're fucking running through the jungle. And the bass is pumping in the background. Again, Paul Newton doesn't get enough credit for his bass playing. I think he was overshadowed by the the player Gary Thane, who would appear on the next album. But his performance on this song and Uriah Heep in general has been really, really good, actually. I think he's an underrated bass player. But anyway, the organ just cuts through, and it's just this epic climax that builds and builds and accelerates. And it just picks up the pace of this extremely, extremely up-tempo, fast section that that's almost like the precursor of like thrash metal, almost. Only with organ and some guitar playing. And the drums are really driving it at this point. The drumming is absolutely heavy as fuck. And it just speeds up and you're like, oh my god, ah! And then it just comes crashing to an end. Uh, and I love the guitar in that part. It has kind of like this squeak to it. This weird squeaky to noise to it. Uh, everything just accelerates perfectly. And it ends up being one of the best Uri Heap songs. Honestly, I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to give this a 9.5 out of 10. I love it that much. It's absolutely blistering. Ken Hensley's organ, some of the heaviest, most distorted shit he was playing up till this point, and one of the faster Uriah Heep songs as well, so uh, amazing way to open up the album. If this doesn't grab you by the balls, then nothing really will. And yeah, I, I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. Coming up on track number two, we got another great feel-good Uriah Heep classic. Surprise, surprise. Uh, this track here is called I Wanna Be Free. And this is really the first example on the album of what I was talking about earlier with the perfect combination of light and shade on the tracks. Uh, it starts off with this ferocious organ and guitar intro that just comes in blaring. But soon that fades away and uh, we get into this beautiful folky harmony uh, laid down by Ken Hensley and... Um, and David Byron, it's a beautiful melody with a light organ in the background, tambourine, again, very folk-like, but it doesn't last long because soon we get this heavy, crunchy riff coming in from Mick Box. Reminds me a lot of the riff from Gypsy. It's just this slow-paced, kind of chugging, uh, mid-tempo riff, which is, which is really cool, especially coming after the rapid-fire barnstorming intro that was Look at Yourself. 
and it's really great. And we still got the harmonized vocals. Really, no no singer is really taking the lead here. And uh, it's kind of funny to think that we wouldn't get David Byron's solo vocals until the next track, which is the last song on side one. So really, the whole album so far has been either Ken Hensley or uh, the, the harmonies. So really interesting. I would have liked a little bit more uh, David Byron, but the harmonies are just fantastic on this song. Feel They just make you feel so good. They're so bright and sunny. And uh, then we get an awesome Mick Box solo, which is in Wawa again, just like Look at Yourself. He's showing that he has a few different tricks up his sleeve, that he's not just playing the Wawa pedal the entire fucking time. And uh, it's just a really nice solo. And I love the falsetto harmonies that come right at the tail end of that thing. It's just really awesome. And I guess David Byron's shining through there because I don't think any of the other band members were able to hit those high-pitched falsetto notes. Awesome. Then closing out the track, we just got an epic grand finale. Again, another Uriah Heap trademark with the slide guitar kicking in, giving it this bluesy feel. But the star of the show here is definitely the vocals. David Byron just screaming, I want to be free, yeah, yeah. I want to be free. Just giving it his all, giving this intense performance. But really, he's not really... Again, I mentioned we wouldn't get his solo singing until the next track. Here, I don't really count it because he's just really screaming and, you know, just adding to the underlying melody of the track. Not really singing any verses or choruses. But he still gives an absolutely intense performance. Like only David Byron can do. So, you know what? I really like I Want to Be Free. Uh, on first listen, this album, uh, sorry, this song might be like the most forgettable on the album, but on an album with such fucking classics, uh, it's still a masterpiece. I would easily give this one a 9 out of 10. Absolutely love I Want to Be Free. Closing outside one, we have the epic 10 and a half minute July morning. A song so great, a song so inspirational, that an entire Eastern European country created a holiday, a festival, based on this track. That's right, guys. I couldn't believe it either. But apparently the nation of Bulgaria uh, really welcomed Uriah Heap with open arms. This album sold really well there. And this track here, July Morning, inspired this holiday where people would gather on the shores of the Black Sea on the 1st of July and watch the sunrise. And it's just this joyous celebration. And it's just hilarious to think that such a lesser known band in comparison to bands like Zeppelin, Purple, Sabbath could inspire a nation like this. And I I find that freaking hilarious. But yeah, apparently if you go to Bulgaria on the 1st of July, people are celebrating July morning. That's right. They named the festival after the track. And uh, it's just it's just insane. I can't think of any other rock band or any other rock song that, in, that really inspired such enthusiasm in an entire population of people. I, I just, I find that hilarious. But yeah, July morning, guys. This song is fucking incredible. It's almost my favorite Uriah Heep song. And I say almost because there is one part at the end of the song that I wish I can go in a fucking time machine, go into the studio, and tell the band not to do this. That's right. It's Manfred Mann's Moog synthesizer playing. That's right. Manfred Mann of Manfred Mann's Earth Band. If you guys have, haven't heard of him, you got to hear the track Blinded by the Light. Absolutely incredible. But yeah, they basically got him as a session musician to add to the uh, the sinister outro of this track, which is absolutely incredible. But he comes in with this Moog synthesizer. For me, it just kills the vibe. And I know that's going to be controversial. Don't sue me. But for the most part, this song is perfection. And I, I really mean perfection. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, it just I, I love everything about it. The organ playing, the slide guitar playing by Mick Box or Ken Hensley. Who knows who's doing it at this point? And... Uh, Man, David Byron's vocals. I kind of alluded to this, that this is the first track where David Byron is singing solo. We still have beautiful harmonies, but man, his unaccompanied vocals are absolutely incredible and really remind you why he's one of the greatest vocalists of all time. Um, if you want to hear like a, a phenomenal performance from him on the previous album, you've got to check out Salisbury, the title track. But this one here might just be his second best vocal performance uh, in, from what I've heard so far. It's absolutely awesome. It starts off with this bright organ intro, just so melodic. And you really feel like the sun is rising. It's just such a bright, sunny melody. And then the slide guitar comes in. And oh my god, guys, this fucking slide guitar just comes bursting through. And it's just such a powerful, intense moment. It's so bright and melodic. And it's just pure musical ecstasy. Then everything dies down. We get some sparse organ notes. And... David Byron just singing with that. I love when David Byron sings in that soft, smoky voice. It's absolutely beautiful. And, uh, oh, man, guys, it's just ah, fucking amazing. But then before you know it, it gets rocking again. The bass comes in and the guitar, and it 
kind of gets into this chugging rhythm. Absolutely beautiful. And, uh, oh man, the acoustic guitar kicks in on the second verse. And then it builds up to this absolutely amazing climactic harmony when the whole band comes in with the vocals, with the, in the day came the resolution. It's just, ah oh man, just amazing. Then it goes back to David Byron's smoky verses and then building up again. And it's just, it alternates between that, that powerful moment and the laid back melodic David Byron vocals. And uh, it's fucking awesome. And then th this amazing organ melody comes in at the 3 minute 40 second mark that just really builds and gets extremely climactic and reminds me of Procol Harum, A Whiter Shade of Pale, the organ playing on that track, which is great because that's, I freaking love that song. And uh, man, it just, it just hits you right there. It just hits you right in the heart. And I, I absolutely love that. And then when it climaxes again after that organ part, uh, the la 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 section just builds up and intensifies until we get David Byron coming in with this absolutely falsetto rendition of that section, just just screaming at the top of his lungs. It's uh, man, the whole song's just been perfect up to this point. Then at the five minute mark, we get this heavy, sinister, ominous riff that just comes out of nowhere. It's just extremely hypnotic, and this would later build into the outro of the track, the famous four minute, you know closing of the song which is entirely instrumental uh and it just totally changes the mood again the band with that light and shade so far the song's been so energizing and melodic and and uh such a feel-good moment such a euphoric song but then this kind of sinister riff comes in and you're like oh wow this this band's got some darkness up its sleeve but uh it doesn't last long and it kind of just goes through the motions again reprising that initial melody and the verses and everything uh and then the last four minutes of the track, we get back into that absolutely ominous melody. And it's a great outro. It's four minutes in length, which is really long for an outro. And it doesn't really change much. Just different instruments coming in and reprising the main melody. With this menacing hypnotic riff, the... That just really goes through the entire rest of the track. And it just creates this, again, this hypnotic bedrock. Uh, it starts off with Ken Hensley's organ taking prominence, but before you know it, Mick Box comes in with the guitar, and uh, it really becomes this heavy guitar-driven riff, and it's absolutely fantastic, and the first time I heard it, I'm like, damn, this is definitely going to build up to an epic guitar solo, it's going to build up to something, but sadly it doesn't, and this isn't my major flaw with the track, instead of erupting into an amazing guitar solo, or even just letting it ride out with that guitar riff, uh, we get Manfred Mann coming in with that infamous Moog synthesizer, and it starts off okay, but it gets a little bit too in your face, a little bit too much, a little too bombastic for me. And it adds that proggy flair, but I don't know, guys. It's just a little too much for me coming at the end of the song. It gives the track this spacey, psychedelic vibe that it really wasn't going for for the majority of its runtime. And I appreciate the light and shade. I appreciate that the song's getting dark and ominous. There's nothing wrong with that. But when that Moog synthesizer comes in and it sounds like you're you know, on Plan 9 from Outer Space or something like that. It just kind of jars with the with the uh, initial melody of the track, where it, it feels campy, it feels a little bit cheesy to me for my liking, and uh, I feel like the song didn't really need that. So, again, this is almost my favorite Uriah Heep song. Salisbury is still number one, but the first seven minutes of this track, or the first eight minutes, however long before the Moog synthesizer comes in, is... Wow, guys, you, you got to listen to it. It's just a textbook example of like a perfect rock, epic length rock song. This, is, this was really Uriah Heep's Stairway to Heaven. This was really their child in time or what, what have you. But the outro just falters a bit for me. So for that reason, I'm not going to give it a 10 out of 10. I'm going to give it a, a 9.5, which I still think is pretty generous. So yeah, July morning, got to check it out, guys. Opening up side two, we have an incredible, incredible song, guys. Tears in my eyes. I, I think this might be one of the most underrated Uriah Heep songs, or at least one of their least talked about tracks. Uh, I, I would say that this is probably a runner-up for my second favorite track on my on the album. Oh, actually, the, my third favorite. I'm forgetting the next song. But I freaking love Tears in, in My Eyes. It's got everything. It's got the light and shade. It's got a weird, progressive kind of song structure. And most of all, it has this bluesy edge that I absolutely love. I absolutely love the blues, and the slide guitar is one of the most prominent instruments in there, and uh, whenever that gets utilized to its fullest capacity, like on this track, 
it just puts a grin on my face. I love the sound of it. And uh, it's just, it's a really heavy, up-tempo track as well. Just everything, everything about the song is amazing. Let's just go through the highlights. Uh, I love the heavy riff it opens up with, but that doesn't really last long because before you know it, we get this blistering slide guitar riff. Oh my god, it's just, it just cuts through. And uh, this is a very rocking blues riff, if I, if I do say so myself. So, incredible slide guitar playing right there. Very up-tempo track. Again, got David Byron coming in with his solo vocals. Just delivering an absolutely electrifying performance as always. And uh, I love the harmonies as well when the whole band comes in with There's a clear blue sky outside and the summer is fine. Again, it adds a little touch of that brightness, a little bit of that color that July morning also had, but in a more rocking, uh, aggressive context. So a pretty heavy barnstorming track. Uh, but then at the 1 minute 30 second mark, everything changes. The song just totally winds down. We get this acoustic guitar going on in the background. And then before you know it, we get this amazing, amazing harmonization with the And the first time I heard that, I gotta be honest with you guys, it was kind of irritating for me. It reminded me of something like a pop band from the 60s, but now I just want to go back and punch myself in the face because this is probably the highlight of the entire track for me. I love the hypnotic harmony that just runs through this entire two to three minute section of the song, kind of acting as like a separate instrument and laying down the foundation, the backdrop for another amazing slide guitar section, which is much more laid back and melodic and not as in your face and aggressive as the slide guitar that opened the track. But uh, it's amazing. And then we get this spacey synthesizer coming in, kind of building up to this amazing crescendo. And uh, and yeah, and then the song kind of, it feels like it ends at the three minute, 12 second mark when the song just comes to a close. And then before you know, we get another blistering slide guitar riff coming in. And you, you think it's a different song. The band really fools you. And uh, the first time I heard it, I was sure that we had moved on to the second track. Because this, this song really felt like one that would end with a bang and it totally does. But then we get this the slide guitar coming back. And uh, it takes you a while to realize that it's actually reprising the intro of the song. Uh, but again, so much has happened since then with that harmonization section that you kind of forget about it, but with repeated listens, you internalize it. But incredible uh, false ending there. Absolutely amazing. Transitions back to the original riff of the song. And, and then you realize, oh my god, this is the same song. So again, a very unconventional song structure here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful song in every single way. So well constructed and arranged. Uh, you could tell these guys were really getting comfortable, really getting ambitious with their song structures here. Yeah, tears in my eyes. Man, I I would I was gonna give it a nine out of ten, but I I I feel like a nine point five today. So today I'm gonna give it a nine point five. Great, great song. Coming up next, we got another long form epic one, guys. Shadows of grief. Um, you know this one here. This is the standout point on side two of the album. Again, Tears in My Eyes, it, it gives it a good run for its money. I really love Tears in My Eyes, but Shadows of Grief is uh, is just something else, guys. It's one of the darkest, more ominous tracks on the album. And one of the, the more ominous tracks in Uriah Heep's whole discography, now that I think about it. Or at least what I've heard up to this point, uh, which now that I think about it isn't really... You know, even scratching the surface. But uh, but yeah, very dark, very heavy song as well. And really progressive in structure, a lot of different sections. Again, just a fantastic arrangement to this track. I feel that, you know, it's eight and a half minutes. And I think it could have been shortened a bit. Maybe they could have just made it, you know, seven or seven and a half minutes. I feel like the last minute of the song doesn't really find a direction. It just wanders all over the place and uh, just shows that the band... You know, didn't really know how to end the track. Again, that's just my opinion. I'm sure there's a, a lot of people out there that absolutely love the last minute or so of the song. And it's not a big deal. It's still enjoyable to listen to. But I, I think the, the magnificence of the first seven minutes of the track just really, you know, overshadows the ending of the song. Kind of ends on, on a disappointing note, if you ask me. But uh, so I, I guess kind of similar to July Morning. But overall, this is a, a phenomenal song. Just an extremely heavy track as well. And has... Some of the most insane harmonies of all time. Absolutely in the falsetto range. And you could definitely see how Queen got their inspiration with their crazy falsetto harmonies. Because it's all here, guys. It's all in Shadows of Grief. And uh, it's also a fantastic showcase for Mick Box performing one of his best guitar solos. 
Uh, very similar to the Salisbury guitar solo, if you guys remember that one from the last album, where right when you think it climaxes, it kind of stops, but then starts again as powerful and as as uh, rip-roaring as ever, and it just reaches another climax and another plateau. That's kind of like the solo on this song, and it's it's absolutely fantastic. Great guitar solo, but really the whole song just falls into place here, guys. Everything about it is awesome. Uh, it starts off with this uh, this kind of strange falsetto section with the organ in the background creating this melody, which would later become the main riff of the track. But uh, at the beginning of the track, it, it feels a little bit weird, a little bit experimental, and uh, you really think, where's the song going to go with this? But then before you know it, the guitar comes screaming in with that riff, the down, 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 reprising that, that vocal falsetto harmony. And then it all comes together. And you're like, oh man, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be a, a definite rocker on the album. And it is, it's, it's a very heavy chugging riff. David Byron comes in, gives a very uh, powerful performance here on the vocals. Uh, it just has this driving heavy feel to it. Definitely something you could headbang to. And uh, David Byron's performance, absolutely intense. Again, just fantastic. Uh, then at the 2 minute 20 second mark, we get this, the song kind of winds down to this creepy church organ section. And then before you know it, the guitar comes in. I, I love this. It does like a nice trade off with the organ. I really love uh, organ guitar battles. And Deep Purple was doing that a lot. You're right, he did it every now and then. But it wasn't a defining feature of their music. But we get a good 30 second sampling of that and then we get into that amazing uh mick box wah wah guitar solo i was telling you guys about it's just it's just great one of his best solos probably his best solo on the album now that i think about it but uh he has a lot of great moments and yeah it's it's awesome and just when you think the song is gonna you know keep up this heavy pace at the four minute mark it suddenly stops and we get really to the defining moment of the entire song what makes the track so creative we get this ominous organ and uh this really sinister and haunting melody. It's just really dark and atmospheric. And it takes it takes its time with it. I mean, this section here lasts for two minutes. And the haunting, almost Gregorian chant-like vocals from the band here are just, again, just send shivers up and down your spine. It's a very dark atmosphere they build there. And I love how it just builds and builds until, again, we get to those falsetto vocals that kind of opened up the album. Again, again gets really intense. There's some more creepy organ over that section there. And uh, again, really creepy. But then before you know it, the original chug and riff comes back in the down, 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 and you're back to head banging. And it's just a great reprise of, of uh, the first part of the track there. And uh, it should have ended at the seven minute mark, or at least it could have ended with a bang. Because again, the song went through this kind of mid slow tempo uh, region in the middle that really brought the, the ominous and dark nature to the track. And then I get what the band was doing by going back to the original kind of heavy upbeat uh, intro of the track and you know they should have ended the song with a bang on a high note but instead at the seven minute mark and for the next one and a half minutes of the track they kind of get back to this weird psychedelic creepy organ and uh, guitar duo the guitar kind of has this squealing effect to it which I, I guess is pretty cool but I would have really have liked the, the song to end with a bang because again we get that energetic section bursting back in and it, it's just, just such a powerful moment but uh, and then we get some more falsetto vocals here and there, and it it just doesn't feel like the song knows how to end. Again, that's my major criticism of it. And then uh, kind of ends. It really ends with this kind of beautiful guitar, this mournful sounding guitar, and uh, some like some vocals on top of that. It's hard to describe the the last minute and a half of this track, just kind of going off in all these weird directions. But uh, again, can't really complain because the rest of the track is just so well done, so perfect. And uh, this is easily a 9.5 out of 10 for me. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a classic track. The high, Definitely the highlight of side two of the album. Uh, so the next track on the album, a little song called What Should Be Done. And earlier on in the video, I mentioned that, you know, you could really classify this song as something, whereas all the other songs on the album kind of change moods and atmospheres so frequently. This one here... You could definitely classify it as the ballad of the album. It's just this slow-burning, dreamy, but beautiful song. And, uh, you know, at first, when I first heard the album, this was the song where I'm like, okay, like, all the songs are fantastic, but maybe that track, What Should Be Done, was a little bit on the weaker side. It's just one of those songs, though, that the more and more you listen to it, the more you realize that this is an, an essential component of the album. I mean, after just so much bombast 
and heaviness. You need something to wind down to. And not only does this song serve as a palate cleanser between the heavier tracks on the album or the more upbeat ones, but it's a great song in and of itself. It's actually a beautiful ballad. It's uh, piano-driven by Ken Hensley, obviously. But then later on in the song, the wah-wah guitar comes in, and it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, or sorry, not the wah Yeah, the wah-wah guitar. And, man, David Byron's vocals. Again, we're getting into that the softer range of his vocals, kind of like the intro of July Morning. And I freaking love that. I love when this guy sings those soft, kind of, you know, warm vocals that just envelop you and blanket you in this warm and fuzzy kind of atmosphere, which is awesome. Like, everyone needs that every once in a while. It's just a great melody as well. Uh, me and my friend, we were listening to it together, and he mentioned, holy shit, the melody actually kind of sounds like a, you can't always get what you want by the Rolling Stones. And then we listen to it, and it does have some similarities, so maybe a little bit of influence there, but it's not like a, a carbon copy, obviously. A lot of differences. Just, it has that, that vibe. It has a little bit of the same chord progression there. But uh, it's, it's a really good song, guys. And again, I mentioned when the wah-wah guitar comes in, it kind of uh, reprises the original piano melody, which the piano's still going throughout the entire song. But I love when that wah-wah guitar comes in. And again, it's so warm and atmospheric, and uh, it just adds another another palette, another color to the, to the song overall. It's just really beautiful. Um, I love the background vocals with the ooh, and uh, <laughs> all the harmonies and everything, like only Uriah Heep were doing at the time. Uh, it's just a, a great song. I don't know what else to say about it, but beautiful song. The album wouldn't be the same without it. And although it's not my absolute favorite song on the album, it's definitely not fillered by any stretch of the imagination. So what should be done? I would say I would give this an 8.5 out of 10. I think that's a fair rating. Well above average, but not you know in the 9 to 9.5 range where we get those masterpieces like Shadows of Grief and July Morning. But yeah, excellent, excellent song. And uh, finally, we close off the album with Love Machine, uh, an awesome track closing out the album, a really upbeat, up-tempo, fiery, bluesy, hard rock tune. And I'm glad they ended off the album with a, with a track like this. Again, this song here, it's, it's very straightforward, it doesn't go off into any experimental territory like Shadows of Grief and July Morning and things like that. It's a pretty straightforward track, but it's just a fantastic, punchy way to end the album, and uh, the playing on it is just fantastic, especially the slide guitar from Ken Hensley, and uh, just, again, David Byron's vocals just really shine on this track. And I feel like I'm a broken record because, you know, David Byron, I haven't heard one performance that he gave that wasn't stellar, but, but this one here is just, he has all those vocal inflections, and it's just a really powerful song. Uh, so it doesn't start off right off the bat as a barnstorming hard rocker. We get this kind of sparse organ, and you don't really know where it's going to go. Uh, kind of has this creepy, haunting vibe to it at first. But then it locks into this organ riff, the din -la -din -la -din 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 -la -din -la and you're, and then you're like, okay, I see where this song's going. Then the drums kick in, the wah-wah guitar, and it's just awesome. It has this amazing driving force to it, like the opening track. Kind of really bookending the album with probably the two more intense songs on the album. And yeah, it's fantastic. And then we got Ken Hensley coming in on the slide guitar, which really defines this track. And again, what a fantastic slide guitar player, giving it this heavy, bluesy edge to it. David Byron's vocals, the vocal inflections I was talking about, where at the end of the line, he just gets into this falsetto range, kind of like what he did on the song Bird of Prey on the previous album, but a little bit less over the top than that. Uh, this one is a little bit more restrained. So, for example, he sings a, the song, I don't care, cause I got to know, and then he, with that, at the end of the no, he gets into that falsetto range, giving the song that, that quirkiness. I, I absolutely love that. There's even a great Mick Box guitar solo with the slide guitar still going on in the background, and uh, some rapid fire organ riffs at the end of the track by Ken Hensley. It's just, everything's just, again, just clicking into place with this track, and uh, again, there's not much to say about it. I feel like you know, a lot of the tracks on this album you just have to listen to. Not much in terms of the analysis of it, but uh, but yeah, Love Machine is a good track. And even the title itself, you can tell they're going for something a bit more straightforward, a little bit more rocking than, you know, epic sounding tracks like Shadows of Grief and July Morning and things like that. And uh, yeah, really, really good song. I don't know what I would give it. I, I'd probably say an 8.5 out of 10 because, again, it's a great track, but nothing, you know, in the masterpiece range. But uh but yeah, awesome song, awesome track here. So that's it, guys. That That's the end of the album. So really seven strong tracks, two major epic length songs that delve into all these weird 
uh, weird sections, for better or worse. In the case of July Morning, that last Moog solo section, probably for the worse. But in the case of Shadows of Grief, that middle ominous section, definitely one of the highlights of the album. And again, a very heavy, rocking album. All the songs just really a masterclass in light and shade in hard rock. And everyone's at the top of their game here. And I gotta say, David Byron, once we get past those first two songs where he isn't really singing much, his vocal performance, like singing, you know, unaccompanied, is uh, once we get past that point, he's just off into the stratosphere, just delivering probably his best vocal performance up until now. And uh, yeah, again, this is the album here that I really think has a little bit for everybody. The next album, Demons and Wizards, that's definitely coming up next, guys. I'm looking forward to reviewing that. Because although I do think that's a fantastic album in its own right, uh, it is a little bit lighter on the lighter, more folky side than this one here. But it's just such a majestic sounding album, and I absolutely love it. Maybe even just as much as this one. But as it stands, I would say that, objectively speaking, this is the best Uriah Heap album and again, Salisbury is my personal favorite so far. I just, I can't get enough of that orchestra on the title track. But, you know, I think for most Uriah Heat fans, this is going to be the one they gravitate towards the most. Uh, either this or the next one, Demons and Wizards. But I really do think that this one here has really got it all. And Demons is, and Wizards is just lacking a bit on the heaviness. So, look at yourself, guys. Incredible album. Definitely stay tuned for more Uriah Heat. More albums coming up soon. And as always, take it easy. Thank you so much for watching. Really appreciate it.